great to be here. Hope that you all go at home and uh, you keep him well. It's good to be able to bring uh, God's word this morning. I'm going to read a few names. If you, if you know, if you recognize any of these names, then just give a thumbs up on, on the comments or something, and, uh, if, you, if you recognize them. Jackie Palo, Mick McManus, Kendo Nagasaki, Big Daddy, and Giant Haystacks. Anyone who knows any of them names, then you're quite officially, you're old. Because, you know, back when I was a kid, then they used to be on Saturday afternoons on, in, in the wrestling on, on uh, ITV Saturday afternoons. Of course, it was all fake. It was all, you know, it was all put on. It was all, it was all pantomime, really. But uh, I took it seriously at the time as a kid. In the Bible, th there's a wrestling match. Uh, it's a, and it's a wrestling match with, with Jacob and a man who turns out to be an angel, who turns out to be perhaps God. The account is found in Genesis chapter 32. Jacob was going back to see his brother Esau after many years of, of being away from him. They'd not parted on good terms. In fact, um, the last time Esau saw Jacob, he, he promised that he was going to kill him the next time he saw him. And uh, so... Uh, things were obviously tense as, as Jacob is going back, is going to see his brother again after all these years. Um, Jacob had actually uh, deceived his, his, his brother and he'd, he'd, uh, he'd, he'd actually tried to rob him. He'd, well, he, he took away his birthright and, his, uh, and, and the blessing that should have been Esau's as the firstborn. So, so Jacob is understandably a little bit concerned as, it, as he's going back to see his brother Esau. And so we're just going to read a few verses from Genesis, a few verses of this account. Um, from Genesis chapter 32, from verse 24. And this is as Jacob is getting ready to see his brother. It says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was, was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask me my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name Peniel, saying it was because I saw God face to face and my life was spared. That's a, st a strange account, isn't it? That's a, a strange passage in the Bible. What's this all about? Do you like mysteries? Do you like mystery books or films? Recently, we watched a film at home and... Uh, when it had finished, my wife said, is that it? You know, we got to the end and none of the ends were tied up. None of the, uh, the it was left open-ended. And she said to me, I like a film where everything's tied up and nothing was tied up in the end. But the film left more questions than answers. Maybe you like the mysteries to be solved. It's one thing I were to watch a mystery on TV or to read it uh, in a book. But what about when that's what life is like? Sometimes there are unanswered questions in, in life. We like life not, not to have too many loose ends, don't we? We like it, the loose ends to be tied up. We like the questions to be answered. But life, especially lately, has been like that with a lot of questions and not as many answers. When we look at the Bible, there are a number of questions in the Bible and a number of mysterious uh, passages, it, but often they're not. There's, there's no answers given to, to some of the, the, the questions to, to the people who were going through the, the uh, circumstances at the time. It's only afterwards as, as people, as you look back, you see how God was working. When you look at the cross, that was, that was a, a mystery at the time. What, what was all that about when it looked, uh, it looked as though it was a defeat? Sinful people put Jesus to death. 
But yet, in it all, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. How does that work out? I don't know, but I believe it with all my heart. For the disciples at the time, it looked as though everything that they believed in had fallen apart. But yet, at the other side of the resurrection, there was hope and there was life. But at the time, they didn't see that. So mystery doesn't have to be a dirty word for us as Christians. It's okay not to know what's going on. It's okay to wonder what God is up to. It's okay to have struggles with the, the stuff that we're facing. That's okay. That's all right. The count of Jacob who wrestles with the angel, with God. That, that is a mysterious passage. It doesn't even spell out really who this is who Jacob is, is wrestling with. First it's a man, then it appears it's an angel. And then as, as you get towards, as you work your way through the story, you see that, there seems to be God is in this. This is actually God. Some people think it might be a, a, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. That that's, that's, could, could well be the case. But yet God is in this encounter. But for Jacob, life suddenly took a strange turn. And a strange and even violent turn when Jacob's all alone and it's night time. And suddenly someone wrestles him to the ground. They're fighting in, in, the, in the dust and in the muck. And it's, it's, a, it's a violent battle. It's a long battle. It lasts all night. It's not a three-minute round. Jacob, is, is, he was all ready to, to camp down for the night, and then somebody jumps out on him. Do you feel guilty if life sometimes can be a bit like that? If life can be a bit of a struggle? Well, you don't have to feel guilty. Look at three aspects of this uh, story, three aspects that, about Jacob that we, that we find from this story. First of all, Jacob was alone. When Jacob had this mysterious encounter with God, he was alone. He, w he had been traveling with a pretty large group of people. He'd got not only his family and uh, servants, but uh, quite a, a lot of livestock. He'd prospered quite, quite well while he'd been away from Esau, so he was going back with, with a large uh, group of people. As it happened, he decided to send everyone else on ahead of him to, to see his brother first. The brother who threatened to kill him, he sent everyone else first. Not, not the bravest thing in the world to do. Maybe he was saying, go on, you go first and I'll be right behind you. Yeah, it was a good five miles at least behind him. But, but Jacob, he, he was left all alone. And then as he's alone, this stranger attacks him out of the blue. When we feel alone, when the difficulties that we face seem, they, they seem so much harder, don't they? It's, it's always good to have somebody with us. If I was uh, in a dark alley at night and somebody jumped out of me, I'd feel better if I had somebody else with me. There's the, the story, it's an old story, you've heard it before, no doubt. There's two men and uh, uh, they're in the jungle and they see a lion coming towards them. And it's, it's eyeing them up and it's slowly walking towards them. The, the first guy, he, he, he gets up and he starts to scarf and, he, and, he, and his mate says to him, what are you doing? You can't outrun a lion. And he says, I don't want to outrun the lion. I only need to outrun you. <laughs> so it's good to have somebody with us, not, not only so that they can get eaten first, but it's good to have somebody to, to support us, isn't it, when we go through the, the, the difficult times, when we feel vulnerable. Thing can, thing, things can seem so much better when we've got somebody else alongside us, someone to stand alongside us. That's why we're called to be a community. That's what we're about as, as church. We're there to support one another, to be there for one another, to encourage one another, however that is. And even more during lockdown when uh, people need encouraging. It might just be uh, an, a phone call, a text, uh, just something just to encourage people, just to let them know that, that you are there. And that's what, we, what we're aiming to do as, as a church, make, making sure that, that people are not left out. Let's make sure that no one's left out, no one's left to deal with things on their own. However, it's still the case, no matter how much we support one another, no matter that, that 
just, we, we can be physically isolated. And that we are, a lot of people are. And so no matter how much we're trying to support one another, some people uh, are alone, some people are, uh, are living alone, and they can't just turn to somebody when uh, they need to, to talk. It might be that you're not living alone, but you're living with, with family, but you, you're homeschooling and you're, you're struggling with that. And you're struggling to, to, to do your job at, at home as well. And, and it's, a, it's a strange time when we don't have that regular connection with our friends who support us. And that, that can be difficult. The isolation that we, we, we still face can make it harder and it can make it more difficult. But Jesus knows what that's like. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was facing his biggest battle as he was looking towards a cross. He knew that the cross was coming and he took with him his three closest friends as he prayed to, to his father. But yet they fell asleep. At his hour of greatest need, his friends weren't there for him. And Jesus understands the struggles that we face. And he walks with us through the struggles that we've, that we've got. But Jacob faces an encounter with God alone. And that's where, we, where each of us have to deal with God. Whether we're in lockdown or we're out of lockdown, we can have friends who support us. We can have people who can lift us up in prayer and can encourage us and give us words of wisdom and spiritual advice. But it, when it comes down to it, God deals with each of us as individuals. Jacob had done a lot of ducking and diving, and he'd evaded a lot of responsibility in his life. But when it came down to it, Jacob had to deal with God alone. And that can be scary sometimes, the fact that, that we've got to deal with God alone, that we've got to come to God, and not, nothing else can stand between us. We've got to deal with God on, on his terms. But it can also be enormously liberating when we know that God loves us so much that he cares for us and that he wants, he wants to be in a relationship with us. But we can't piggyback someone else's faith. You can't rely on the relationship that your husband, your wife has with God. You can't rely on the relationship that your, your, your parents, your, your children, your friend, the church leader, your connect group leader, your favorite Bible teacher, favorite right a worship song you can't rely on any of their relationship that they've got with god they might have a, a good relationship but you can't rely on that you've got to know god for yourself and you've got to know god through jesus that's the way that that we come to god through through jesus jesus said, i'm the way the truth and the life and so it doesn't matter how good the relationship that somebody else has got with god how well they know jesus You've got to come to the point, each of us have got to come to the point where we know Jesus for ourselves. That's where God works with us. He doesn't work through anyone else. He works through Jesus. So we can't rely on someone else's faith. But once we know Jesus, once we come to a relationship with Jesus, then we need to spend time alone with him then and we need to learn to grow and to feed our spirits. Sometimes it might take us stripping away of all the excess stuff around us. We're encouraged in Hebrews to, to lay aside all the things, all, the, all the, the excess stuff, all the sin that easily ensnares us. And sometimes we have to lay things aside and to put it to one side and to the things that interrupt our relationship with Jesus. And it's going to be the same when things get back to normal, whatever normal is. It, it's, it's, it's the same throughout any time. We, there's things we need to lay aside to come to know Jesus better. And then the second thing about Jacob is that Jacob struggled. Sometimes some of our biggest struggles are not with the devil, but they can be with God. The encounter that Jacob had with God was one of struggle. They wrestled all night. Jacob was in a struggle. He'd struggled all his life, Jacob. He was a restless man. He struggled even when he was being born, when he grabbed onto his brother's heel as he, were, as he were being born. He struggled with his brother throughout his life when Jacob was constantly trying to get one up on his brother. Then when he, he moved away, went to live with his uncle Laban, he struggled with him. His, his relationship was, with him was one of struggle. Jacob's name actually means deceiver. Sorry if there's anybody called Jacob out there, but, but that's what the name meant. Jacob was a man who lived up to his name. And he deceived and he struggled throughout his life. That's the way he went through life. But Jacob met his match when he was struggling with God. 
And in this strange passage, why would God do this? Why would he jump out on Jacob and start this, this wrestling match with him? As I've already said, it's a really mysterious passage. But when life is mysterious and it raises so many questions, then God still wants to speak to us. Maybe Jacob thought, well, if God wants to speak to me, why don't he just speak to me in a dream? He can do all that. It would be so much easier. But this is the way God dealt with Jacob. Jacob must have felt like God was treating him like an enemy. Sometimes when God doesn't act like we hope that he would do, it can seem like that. It can seem as though God is acting like an enemy. Sometimes we've got unanswered questions as we struggle to get to the bottom of them. Why doesn't God seem to step in when we think that he should? If you've ever talked to anyone about your faith in Jesus, then I'm pretty certain that sooner or later, probably sooner rather than later, they've asked the question that, that they always ask, why? If God is so good, if God is so loving, if God is who you say he is, then why is this happening? They might point to something in their life. They might point to things around the world. Why is there suffering? Why is... Why is all this stuff happening? And it's a good question. It's actually a struggle that we as Christians face that, that non-believers don't have. You know, if someone's not a believer, if someone says, I don't believe in God, you know, I don't believe he exists, and they see bad things happening around the world, and you know, this, at the end of the day, they say, well, that's sad, that's, but that's just the way life goes. But as believers, we know that God is all-powerful. We know that God is all good. But yet, some things he doesn't seem to, to act upon like we would like him to. And sometimes we can struggle and think, why? Well, why is that the case? Do you ever think like that? Because I do sometimes. Jacob's encounter with God was, was painful. And that can be the case with us. It can be painful, our encounters with God. One well-known Bible teacher talks about something that he calls the betrayal barrier. He says that, that sooner or later, all Christians feel betrayed by God. He says we feel like he's let us down. The question is, when we, when we get to that point, will we break through it? Will we get to the other side or will we give up and step back? The people in the Bible who, who felt betrayed by God, I'm sure Jacob did, um, Elijah, he just faced a, 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 an enormous victory, but then from the valley, he went right, from the mountain, he went right down to the valley when he, he felt all alone. He says, there's no one left who serves God, only me. Of course, he was wrong, but that's how he felt. Jeremiah felt that way too. In fact, he actually accused God of deceiving him. Of course, that's how he felt. That's not how, what God did. God, of course, God didn't. But in his heart, that's how he felt at the time. We all have struggles with God. And there will be times when our questions that would dearly love to be answered are left unanswered. But don't let God's apparent indifference to what you're going through make you think that he doesn't care. Because he does. He has still got a blessing for Jacob. And he wants to bless us as well. One of my dad's friends, uh, back, uh, back on when, a, f a couple of years back, just about 18 months back, uh, uh, at his funeral, um, he, said, he said to me, he says, God tells us everything that we need to know, but not everything that we want to know. And that's so true, isn't it? Tells us everything we need to know, not what we want to know. There's questions we'd probably like to have answered, but that he doesn't always answer. But then... Jacob also persevered. In his struggle with God, Jacob persevered. There was a chance for him, actually, to get away from this, from this battle. The angel, God, said, let go of me. Jacob was holding on to him, the rest of the land, and he says, let go of me. Jacob says, I will not let go unless you bless me. Jacob could have got away. He could have got away from the struggle. He could have got away from being battered and bruised. But he said, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to hold on to God. I'm going to hold on to you because I believe that there's a blessing in this. 
Jacob saw beyond what was naturally happening and he said, this God is in this. There's a blessing to be found. Perseverance is not a word that's very attractive, is it? It's definition. It's perseverance is the quality of continuing with something, continuing, continuing with something, even though it is difficult. I don't like difficult. I don't want to have to persevere. It would be nice if things were just handed to me. That would be, that'd be better, wouldn't it? But that's not the way it goes. When God said, let go of me, Jacob's response was, I'm hanging in for the blessing. He knew there was a blessing to be had. He knew that this just wasn't a man, but God was in this encounter. He was in this situation. What does it mean to persevere when we're going through strange times, when we're going through these times of mystery? What does it mean? There doesn't seem to be any obvious reason to why we're facing what we're facing. But it means that even though we don't see the reason behind it, even though we don't know the reason behind what we're going through, we are still going to trust God. Even though it's a struggle, even though it's hard, we're going to hold on and we're going to say that there is blessing in trusting in Jesus. I was reading this week, and not particularly in reference to me, uh, what I'm preparing, but uh, this is actually something that Bear Grylls says. And he says, when we are secure in the presence and love of God, it's much easier to trust him for the mysteries that are hidden from our view. When we're secure in the presence and love of God, it's much easier to trust him for the mysteries that are hidden from our view. And that's the secret to knowing that in Christ we are secure. When we know that, when we know that we're secure, then it gives us Really, it liberates us. We can know that we are eternally secure when we've trusted in Jesus. If, if you trusted in Jesus this morning, then you are secure. Nothing can take you, can pluck you from the hand of Jesus. When that truth grips us, it liberates us and it transforms us. When we know that Jesus holds on to us and that we are secure, whatever else happens, whatever rubbish seems to come to us, Whatever uh, troubles seem to come our way, we are secure in the hand of Jesus. Jesus said, the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. The more that truth sinks in, the more that we, are, that we trust him, then the more the struggles and the unanswered questions, we realize that we can trust him with them as well. Having the security that God will sustain us through the times of mystery, is liberating. We sing the song, I'll raise a hallelujah in the, in the middle of the mystery. And that's what we need to do. We need to, when the unanswered questions, then we can still praise God. And if we say, I'm going to praise you, God, even though I don't understand. That's what them words are saying. I'm going to praise you, God, even though there's so much that I don't know the answers to, even though I want the answers and, and I don't have them. Even though I'm struggling to, to, to understand it, I'm going to praise you. And I'm going to keep on praising you, God, because you are faithful. Because you, you sent your son to die for me. That's how much God loves us. And if, um, and if he loves us so much, then we cannot doubt his love. Last week, Paul mentioned in Hebrews 11 about the faith chapter. Those who, who had faith. It, it tells us a great list of people who had faith. But none of them ever saw the full picture but God was still faithful to them. Having unanswered questions doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us. Going through times of mystery doesn't mean that we've taken a wrong turn necessarily. Encouraged again in Hebrews, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Band want to make the way back up. But we can be confident when we're going through mystery. We can have confidence that there is a blessing on the way. We need to make a choice that we're still going to praise God. Even though the way forward is not always clear, we need to make a choice. We're going to praise God. Remember, our struggles don't last forever. And if we hold on to God, if we say, I'm going to hold on to you, God, and I'm going to wait for the blessing. Then the blessing will come and it will bless us abundantly. He's got so many blessings to give us. We need to hold on to one another. 
continue to hold one another, hold one another up and encourage one another. Give each other words of encouragement. We've had so many uh, occasions of people who have done that at Hope House during, during lockdown. People have been encouraged by, by what has been happening, by people that sending them a message, sending them a text, phoning, phoning them. So do that, hold one another up. Most people will probably not know what you've done, but do it anyway because it's, it, we're doing it to, to bless one another. J Jacob came through this situation transformed. His name was changed to Israel. His name was changed from deceiver to Israel, which means a prince with God. Jacob was transformed, and God can transform us. If you've never known Jesus, if you've never trusted him, then I'd encourage you to give your la life to him. I want to say a prayer now, and if you've never trusted Jesus, then just pray this along as I, as I pray it. It's, a, it's a, a prayer of commitment for people if you want to give your life to Jesus because there's no better thing. It says, Lord Jesus, I know I have done things wrong in my thoughts, my words and actions. There are so many good things I have not done. There are so many wrong things I have done. I am sorry for those wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross. Gratefully, I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life, come in as my saviour to clean me. Come in as my Lord to heal me, and I will serve you all the remaining days of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and just contact us at Hope House. Just, there'll be details on the screen. Just let us know that you've prayed that. We'd love to help you. We'd love to encourage you. And just thank you for, for listening. God bless you.